This program is sponsored by the National Endowment for Humanities. Welcome to the William C. Goodrich Freedom Center and Underground Railroad Museum. Thank you for joining us for our Preserving Voices of Freedom project. The William C. Goodrich Freedom Center and Underground Railroad Museum will host six Live and Learn events. These events will engage the community in discussions surrounding culturally relevant and historically significant topics. Welcome to the Goodrich Freedom Center and Underground Railroad Museum. Just a quick note, well, we'd like everyone to mute their microphones while we're listening to the presentation. The Goodrich Freedom Center is located at 123 East Philadelphia Street in York, Pennsylvania. My name is Allison Renner and I'm the curator of photography at the museum. This episode is Freedom Center is also the home of the Glen Alvin Goodrich Reproduction Daguerreotype Gallery. This is our fourth episode in the Preserving Voices of Freedom series and tonight's episode is entitled How Men of Color Are Viewed Through Photography. This presentation is funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Could you please introduce yourselves? Well, ma'am, would you go first? Well, thank you. I am Lydia Hamilton Smith. Uh, I was born in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and uh, soon moved to Lancaster to work for the Congressman Penny Stevens. And while there, I, I learned about the art of finance, which enabled me to buy six homes in Lancaster, one in Gettysburg, and one in Washington, D.C. So I had a great deal to be grateful for. Well, uh, <laughs> it is such a pleasure to be back in my home. I lived here for more than 30 years. My name is William C. Goodrich, station master on the Underground Railroad and businessman in York. Not just a successful businessman, but I had children who were also in a business. Both my my sons, Glenn Alvin and Wallace, were daguerreotypists, uh, maybe I must say photographers of today. And they became quite, quite important. As a daguerreotypist, both my sons were important in Saginaw, Michigan. But they were, they were noted for photographing the growth of Saginaw, Michigan. But I am happy to be in my home today, as I am happy to welcome my good friend, Lydia Hamilton Smith. Well, thank you, Mr. Goodrich, for allowing us to meet in your home, as so many other abolitionists did before us, and to talk about provocative subjects with freedom and mutual respect. My first question is for both of you. As you both know, Frederick Douglass was the most photographed man in your time. And when asked why he was so livid at an engraver's depiction of himself with a slight smile, he replied that his expression was too amiable for a fugitive slave. His white counterparts were afforded the dignity of a serious gaze in their portraits, and certainly he deserved that respect as well. He is quoted as having said, Negroes can never have impartial portraits at the hands of white artists. Is this an idea that you agree with, and if so, why? And can you tell us of any instances where you witnessed a false depiction of a man? Ms. Smith, would you like to go first? Okay, thank you. Um, I should say, I, I agree with Mr. Douglas that uh, he should have the opportunity to, to look as serious as his work. The work he did was extremely important and rested on working and saving the lives of many. So he was very serious about what he spoke on. And to have him smiling was serious and people were dying because of being enslaved. I, I totally agree that he should have that opportunity to look serious as the subject for which he was speaking on. And do you think that it's possible or that uh, a, a Black person could have an impartial portrait at the hands of a white artist? Or do you agree with Frederick Douglass and that he didn't think that that, that was possible. No, I, I, again, I would agree with him because some of the photographs in which they were placed 
was most undignified on many, many occasions. And uh, they twisted them to be less than what they were as a person. So I totally, totally agree. I, I also must agree with Fred Douglas. He was your he friend. Was, yes, he was. And he was a serious man. He was a serious man about his business. He was a serious man as an abolitionist. And for one to take his likeness and put a little smile on it may give the appearance that he wasn't serious. I understand when we talk about things, particularly if you're a black man, we have to be clear on what we mean and that is even how we present ourselves. So Fred was, was that kind of person. And being the most photographed person, he was certainly photographed more than I, uh, he would have, he would have to say, no, this is not right. No, I should be depicted as the services that I was rendering. So I must agree. I, I, I truly must agree that Fred was, how in this vernacular of today, was on point. <laughs> Very much so. This question is for Ms. Smith. I was just thinking of your contemporary Sojourner Truth. I don't know if you knew her personally or not. I did not, but know of her. Of course. Um, one of her ports, on her portrait, she often had printed the phrase, I sell the shadow to support the substance, and she was able to control her own narrative and call attention to the subjects that she held dear, not least of which was her family, which I know is also important to you. In one particular photo, she's posed with a case image on her lap with her grandson who was serving in the Civil War at the time. I know your sons were a cherished part of, of your life. Can you talk about how their representation affected you in it? And if you ever felt that there was a time in which they weren't reflected accurately, and do you know of any portraits of them? Well, sadly, no, I have no portraits of them, but many things were written about them, and most were most unfavorable. They were depicted as rascals and troublemakers when they themselves worked very hard uh, to get educated, to run businesses, they both had businesses. And they, uh, they worked hard to show as a man, and a man of color, a businessman, that this is something others could aspire to, but they were constantly torn apart mm -hmm. to make them look less than what they were. Mr. Goodrich, can you think of an example at a time when one of your family members was, was depicted in a negative light? Well, of course, that brings to mind my treasured son, Renal, and all the accusations that was thrown upon him, particularly when we know that was not him. See, here's how I look at things. You almost have to be that person. My son, Glenn Alvin, as you may know, was accused of assaulting someone, someone he did not assault. And he spent time in prison. Now that was very difficult for me. I have to say that when we are looked upon whether it's one line in a paper, it typically is not correct. What came to mind was those posters when somebody ran away. Oftentimes, they were drawings. They may not have been photos, but they still meant and represented the same thing. Their lips were outside of natural size, and they made the body structure look unnatural so that we appear to be more animal than human. Those things were troubling to me. 
and they will be troubling even today. When I read the newspapers of today, I love when I'm spirited back, but when I look at how the men today, the black men today are portrayed, it almost it hurts my heart because oftentimes they are portrayed like animals. There was this one case where there was a gentleman, and we're talking pictures, moving pictures, where the officer, somewhat like our slave catchers, had his knee on the black man's neck. That image haunts me. Every time I'm spirited back, I think about how that person must have felt. But see, we can't get just hung up on a photograph when we have moving pictures now, because all of those things speak to how black men and women are still being treated. I could go on and on about what I read in your papers today. That's a good segue into my next question, and it's for you, Mr. Goodrich. As the father of an early photographer, you must have been able to view photographs long before most people did. And what was your impression of the way that the likeness showed the truth of a person in the way that other mediums had not? And do you think contemporary 21st century images of men of color depict the same level of accuracy? Well, I must say I'm a little partial <laughs> to my son Glenn Allen. I believe that every photo he took was, was a perfect medium. <laughs> there is a difference. I do see that. I even saw during my time that when a white man takes a picture of a black man, it is through his eyes for which he sees us. But when a black man takes a picture of another black person, it is through the eyes of a black person. So oftentimes I wonder, what do you actually see in us? Do you actually see that animal or that person who seems to always have that subservient expression on their face? I often wonder, is that really what white daguerreo photographers saw in us? When my son Glenn Al took one of a black person, it was through a black person's eye. So he wanted this, to see the softer part in the individual. He wanted people to see the person that is behind the eyes. So I would say that there is a clear difference in when a white person takes a photo of a black and when a black person takes a photo of a black. Pretty much like, I guess, if I were a photographer or the girl typist and I was taking a picture of a white person, you may not want to see it because I would probably see all the evil. And when I take that picture, when I take that likeness, it probably will show how I feel about that person. So it's probably best my sons were the Geralds. And they were such incredible, not only businessmen, but artists that whatever their personal feelings were, were not necessarily reflected in the photos. I probably would have looked at all the sadness that I saw coming through my station. I probably would have looked at the mothers who could not come with their children and the fathers that could not protect their wives. So <coughs> it is probably best. May we have some water, yes. please? I, I, these lights are sometimes very hot <laughs> from being spirited back. We are often spirited back as many as 12 times in one calendar year. You probably live as many times here as you do back in your own time. I have to think about that. <laughs> it's a shame that Glenn Alvin and his brothers did not have the chance to do more documentary work. They were doing formal work just for, in a very business-like capacity. And, and didn't live at a time when they could have done more work that might have been able to, as you said, sometimes said to me, kind of push the needle. I agree, <laughs> and particularly why they were in York. Yeah. The Saginaw, they became important for the growth of Saginaw. So in a sense, they were doing that type of thing. It just wasn't the, I should say, 
the human subject that they were doing it on. Yeah, trees uh, instead of it social would justice. have been <laughs> nice for such a person as Glenn Alvin, who, with the help of his brother Wallace, to do something to document how the enslaved moved up across the Mason and Dixon line into a freer space. <coughs> Oh, oh pardon me. Nice. I, I was <laughs> but the heat. <laughs> Do you have vapors? <laughs> <laughs> yes. While you're composing yourself, I think I'll just direct the, the next question to Mr. Goodrich. There's a very famous photo from the time of the Civil War, which shows the back of Gordon, who was um, scorched by a whipping that he received at the hands of his overseer. How do you think this image helped the abolitionist cause? Mm. When I think about that picture that I see so often when I'm spirited back, it pains me because we are actually looking at the horrors, the wealths, the crisscross, oh, mm. it hurts. I believe that if more people saw that during my time, that more would have been interested in the Underground Railroad and helping people get to freedom. But it was limited then. And it was used often to, to discourage the other Blacks. So do you think in that sense that it had a dual purpose, that it might have helped the abolitionist cause, but then also it was used by people who might have perverted that notion for their own use? I believe that the perpetrators actually thought they were making it harder for us to move from one place to another. I actually believe that. And it goes back to, through whose eyes are we seeing such a picture? But on our side, it would make someone want to help. It would make someone want to be part of that then secret society. I would agree with that. I think seeing that photo would have encouraged those enslaved to seek their freedom more so because they did not want that for their family, for their children, for themselves. Mm -hmm. So to show that to what they thought would hinder them and make them stay actually gave them the strength to to seek to move forward yes to move forward mm -hmm. well I, while i was thinking about gordon um it reminded me of another group of photographs and while gordon was able to give his consent when he had his picture made um, others were not granted that agency and i was thinking of the daguerreotypes that were made in 1850 by the Harvard zoologist when he commissioned them, the, what, what are now known as the Zeely daguerreotypes, um, to bolster his ideas of white su superiority. In the process, several enslaved individuals were forced <coughs> to pose in various states of undress. Uh, what is your reaction to the photos of the enslaved individuals? And I have their names, and I think it'd be important for us to just take a moment to think about them. It's Jem, Alfred, Delia, Renti, Messina, Drana, and Jack. And what can we do from a contemporary standpoint to right the wrongs committed against these individuals? Have you seen these images? I have, I have, and tore at my heart because you could see in their eyes the indignity and the shame. Almost, I believe it was Delia, the tears were forming in her eyes. And that, that, that took to my heart, broke my heart to see such a thing, what they would do to them. And I think that was, again, made to shame them and to show that they were less bad. They were not important 
and took my breath away. It was something I discovered when I was spirited back. And when I looked at Remy, I said, this is a man who heir to this world. This is a man that had no dignity. And the purpose, and the purpose was to prove something we know that are not blacks, that blacks are a lower form of humans. If in fact, he referred to us as humans. But he was using the face, the structure, the body to try to prove something. Now, we know that even back in my time, it was easy to make something appear to be what it is not. Because when we came over from the ships, they took our language. And when you take someone's language, then try to pour in your language. I remember watching how the overseer would have people around, mostly whites, and they would ask the enslaved individual a question in English. And of course, that African stumbled. I don't know what you're saying. And at that very minute, everyone around there was saying, he's illiterate, he's stupid. They are less than us. See how easy it is to convince someone of something that is not. That professor, and I hate to call him a professor, I would prefer to call him a monster. That monster took pictures of disrobed blacks to prove that we are a lower form being. And the sad, the awful thing about it is that I believe some people believe that. And now that the descendants, now that the descendants would like to have their, what I consider their property, back to give them dignity even after death. It appears to me that that Harvard place had the opportunity to be magnanimous. Three syllables, I can say that. <laughs> he, they had the opportunity to give them and they refused. The lawsuit I last read was also in the favor of Harvard. That is troubling. How can we change that? By holding those people now accountable, saying that you destroyed them in life. You're still trying to destroy them in death. Do we ever win when it comes to property? See, I guess it's hard to own property when you are considered property. So that is heart-wrenching. And I know, Miss Lydia, when you look at the young lady, I know you are feeling those kinds of what was behind her eyes, sensitivity, because I know I feel that when I look at Remy. My heart went out. Well, you, you, you know what, Miss Lydia? You typically have your tear jar with you. you sure? Now, would you explain to them what a tear jar was used for? Basically, it was used to catch your tears. And our custom in that time was you put your tears in the jar, you let it sit. And once the tears evaporate, you know that your loved one has gone on and you can now move on with your life. So they were to sit in that jar. And I don't know that I have one with me today. It was, it's important that uh, this family be made whole. I know what it felt like when they took my, oh, you have one I with you. One with me. 
maybe we both should share some tears and yeah. hope that when they dry, that Harvard would do the right okay. thing and allow these individuals to have possession of the only thing left of the family back during slavery. Mm -hmm. And it is sad. I am hoping that nothing of Glenn Albans end up in the hands of someone who don't treasure the artist he was and the man that he was because he suffered. He suffered from lies. Mm -hmm. So yes, we both feel <clears throat> pain in our heart over Rennie and the other guy. I think it's, there's a great irony in the fact that they were lost to time until the 1970s. And then mm. once they surfaced again, they became another commodity that's traded and bartered and owned once again. Once again. Hmm. Bondage comes in all sorts of ways. It is something that I do when I'm spirited back. I ask the people particularly the young people, to become abolitionists, to become part of that movement for the very reason that we are talking about today. I'm eager to see when I'm spirited back some of my son's photography in this place. They've gotten to be very popular and they're all over the world in institutions from Yale, to the Nelson Atkins Museum, to the Library of Congress, you'd be very proud. But you scare me when you say one of those institutions. <laughs> I have just a few more questions and then we'll take questions from the audience as well so everyone can prepare them and put them in the chat. Um, it was W.E.B. W. E. Du Bois who was adamant that the documentation of Black families should be mindful of representation. He often used an elevated version of the Black family to counteract the narratives of previous generations. Who do you think in the 21st century do you think helps to exemplify this elevated depiction of Black life? Oh my. I can think of... It could be from your time as well. I can think of... I, I certainly can think of Frances Ellen Watkins Harper and her poetry was elevation. And then doing your, your civil rights movement, there was Martin Luther King and... Oh my, there are learned people now. There are professors and that are elevating the black family. I also have to get quite personal. My home that I owned for this somewhat 30 years is now owned by a black organization. And that black organization, named after no other than Christmas Alex, loves the fact that they elevate who the black man and the black woman and the black children are. This is a perfect place for my home to land. Indeed, and I, I certainly agree with that. Mm. I think of, and it took my breath away when I came back and found that a black man was a president of the United States. Oh. His wife, a most elegant woman, and their family took my breath away. Did you ever think you would see it even spirited back? Never, never. And now you have a woman who is the vice president, a black woman of these United States. And they do bring in the family. Everything is about family. But I will circle back <clears throat> to we're here about photography. And I agree with you. I follow that. I'm and circling back to photography. There was in all that beauty of having that black president and first lady of the White House, there was one photograph of the first lady that showed her arms. And they complained that that was not quite ladylike. Then why would you take such a close-up of her arms? You see, they are still, even with the elevation, still trying to make us less than what we are. 
She is such a beautiful woman. Yes, yes. Much like my Evelina. The concept of photographs and moving photographs are very important and today and how people look at one another. Hmm. Such a good subject matter. As you speak of, of the photographs of the First Lady, I, I recall seeing a photograph of the President looking very dapper, but he had on a very light colored suit. And the words and the things they said about how dare he. he I thought he looked very professional, very dapper, but again, they took that photograph and they tried to tear him apart because they felt he was less than. Yes, it's sad that they are taking such an amazing art. Photography is an amazing, can be used for so many wonderful things, and yet people still doubt it back to make it less than what it should be. Now, I did give consent, <laughs> unlike many, but I am still hoping that I will be viewed as the person that I believe that I am. I must say, sir, I have come across two of these moving pictures in which I was represented in a most unfavorable light. One was with the Congressman Patty Stevens, where they made me to be a they call it a gold digger. Is this in Birth of a Nation? <clears throat> yes, yes. A most unfavorable, unkind. Oh, picture. that Birth of a Nation. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. That is not uh, the visual media that we would like to represent. Exactly, exactly. And then once again with this picture called Lincoln, where again I was. Caught in an uncomfortable position in a bed, uh, I believe. Oh, <laughs> as they would wish that that would happen, but again, made me to look as though I was, I could not be a businesswoman. I had to be less than because I could not be in such position to know the people that I knew and to be treated as an equal with these people. That there had to be something about me that was less than. <laughs> So again, I, the gentleman who created that movie picture, I actually sent him a letter and invited him to tea, but he <laughs> dared not answer me. <laughs> I have yet to hear from him. I don't understand why when you're recreating the, histor the history, mm -hmm. you would take the time to disparage such a brilliant woman such as yourself. Thank you, thank you. Mm. It, it speaks a lot to the, the culture at large that while we've moved forward, yes, we move backwards. I think maybe now we'll uh, see if there's any questions from the audience. Since we don't have any questions, uh, do you have any final thoughts that you would like to impart while you're spirited back? Miss Lydia? Uh, yes, I uh, <clears throat> definitely, as I, I sometimes have the opportunity to talk to the young ladies of this time, and I encourage them because I say, if I can be successful in my time when I am thought to be as a person of color less than, doubly so as a woman of color, I was treated less than. And then being a single mother <laughs> to children, very less than, but I succeeded. So I tell them, do not let your circumstances, your situation determine your success because you have every opportunity and to push forward and do so. I would make mine a little bit more personal. I would like the photographers of today to walk in the light of my son, Glen Allen, to love that art, to when you photograph things, photograph them in true honesty. And if that honesty is something that is not so kind, that is all right. But walk in the light of Glenn Alvin and those who came after him who did wonderful things. Use that medium today. Use that instrument. Use that instrument. 
to make a difference. When you depict a black person, depict them as the person that they are, not who you wish them to be so that you can be elevated. Don't use our likeness to make you feel good. Oh, we do have one question. This question is from Mr. Goodridge. Are you related to the Goodridge Brothers Photography? I would like to believe that I am. <laughs> they were my son. They were my sons. All right. I would like to thank everyone who joined us, uh, whether from the 1800s or in our audience. And thank you so much to the National Endowment for the Humanities, to Chris Basadics, to the Goodridge Freedom Center, and the Daguerrean Society who donated the camera that you see behind us, which is of the time period of Mr. Goodrich.